and welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, the podcast that wrestles with the existential horror of fictional worlds and the existential horror of our world, with some existential horror about the comics industry thrown in on occasion. But um, that just introduced today's special guest. Uh, we'll be talking about the, the uh, new comics horror anthology called Mirror Mirror 2 uh, with Julia Groher and Shanti Collins. Wait, Julia, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, that was fine. Yes. Editors Julia Groher and Shanti Collins have amassed some of the darkest talents within as well as outside the comics world to create a wholly singular reading and visual experience. From masters of horror like Clive Barker to leading figures in alt comics such as Simon Hanselman, this collection focused on intermingled themes of horrorography, the gothic, and the abject. Mirror Mirror 2 transcends the expectations of what a comics anthology can do. Mirror Mirror features new and unpublished work from Lala Albert, Clive Barker, Heather Benjamin, Apollo Cacho, Sean Christensen, Nicole Clavelu, Shanti Collins, Al Columbia, Dame Darcy, Gretchen Alice, Felker Martin, Noel Freitbert, Renee French, Megan Garvey, Julia Groher, Simon Councilman, Adrian Koch, Laura Lands, Celine Loop, Una Morales, Moo, Johnny Negron, Claude Paradin, Chloe Pinier, Josh Simmons, Carol Swan, and Trung Jules. I think I got that. Um, and a little bit about our guests. Julia was born in 82 in Concord, New Hampshire. Her work has appeared in Thickness, Arthur Magazine, Study Group Magazine, Black Eye, Kramer's Ergot, and multiple volumes of the Best American Comics. Her graphic novels, Black is the Color and Laid Waste, are both published by Fantagraphic Books. Shanti Collins has written for Rolling Stone, The New York Times, Wired, Vulture, Esquire, Pitchfork, The Comics Journal, and others. His comics have been published by Marvel, Top Shelf, Study Group, and Youth in Decline. He and Julia live with their children on Long Island. Uh, and Mirror Mirror is the publisher Sec 2D Cloud's annual flagship anthology. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, Hi. thank you for having Good to be back. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Sean joined us to talk about Jessica Jones when I was doing my deep dive on the, uh, the podcast. I guess it was over a year ago. And um, additionally, he's someone whose work first came on my radar through his critical writing uh, about Game of Thrones, Twin Peaks Now, and actually one of my favorite essays about playing Dungeons and Dragons as, as a teenager, which folks should definitely dig out on his own blog. Um, and Julia came to my notice on Tumblr, which is funny because Tumblr is like, I guess there's a certain ideas about what Tumblr art aesthetic is, and Julia's work is very much in a different vein and style than that. So it feels sort of funny to say that I first found her work on Tumblr, but um I was immediately, you know, attracted. To, <laughs> I was immediately attracted to the really detailed, like almost looking thing that was carved into the paper, uh, dark black line work, and the really haunting subject matter. I, I think I've had a whole lot of emotional reactions, including crying, in response to your work. So, thank you both for joining yeah. us on the show. Yeah, I think that's like your Thanks. intent, right? That's what you're going for here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I'd love to hear a bit. You guys have worked on comics together, like mini comics that you guys have done uh, together in the past. Uh, but I think this is this this is the second edition of the anthology that you guys have have, have done uh, as as a, as a duo. And um, I'd love to hear a bit about like what was the core concept that you had going into this project, and why do it as an anthology uh, as opposed to just continuing to do your own individual, I guess, collective uh, comics together. Well, the anthology is the one that is published by 2D Cloud. That's a, um, maybe one of the most interesting small press comics publishers right now. They're doing a lot of really outside the box, very creative, artistic work. And uh, so the first Mirror Mirror was curated by Arme, who's an artist who is much more interested in uh, dealing with abstraction and uh, brought in a non-narrative work. Uh, and then when we were invited to do the second mirror, um, we wanted to kind of in the opposite direction from that. We were really interested in narrative work. We wanted to be uh, very open about trying to pursue feelings as opposed to like an intellectual philosophical experience um, to make it 
visceral to make it kind of uh, painful in a way, mm-hmm. not necessarily in a negative way, but in a way where you, you uh, were connecting to the work in, uh, in, in like a deep kind of uh, helpless way. And it's funny because if you look at the two volumes, um, you know, Blaze's volume, volume one is, is, you know, the cover is white. It's very open and airy. The, the actual, the dust jacket for the book actually folds out into this, like, it's very thin, it's very thin, like, poster almost. It's an, on each page, a lot of room to breathe. And our book is, yeah, it's as different as black and white, literally. Like, our book has, like, <laughs> black, like, the down cover. The, the pages is black, if you look at it from the side. You know, and the content is, bla- is as black as our hearts. So, it wound up being <laughs> That's one of the cool things about 2D Cloud is that when it, when Rain Hogan and Maggie Umber, who were the co-publishers, conceived of this idea of handing over mythology that represents their publisher to completely different artists every single time to edit, and the difference is that dramatic. And, and I think it's worked for them. I'm super curious to see what volume three is going to be about or what color it's going to be or anything like that. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I actually wasn't familiar with the first one. Uh, it's, our show, I mean, the comics that we generally cover tend to be narrative. And usually when we're talking about indie, which we are very often, we're talking about publishers more along the lines of Black Mask, who still are predominantly mm-hmm. putting out, you know, very narrative, uh, generally action heavy comics, even if it's from an independent sort of standpoint. Uh, and, I, you know, I generally like when I when I see more, I guess, art art comics, I don't, I, or I'm not really sure quite what to refer to the genre. It's not a genre. Yeah, I guess it's a different approach. Um, it's generally because I just came to Mocha Festival, which is the big uh, festival for illustration and comics art that definitely has a approach where like something like image, like isn't even like, that's not even up. That's not a, that's not independent. That's like a whole different world. Um, so this, right. this publisher was definitely new to me. And um you know, there was definitely a few artists in here whose work I was familiar with already, like Councilman or Dame Darcy, who I actually, you might appreciate this because I think you guys are about my age. I actually first heard about Dame Darcy's work reading Sassy Magazine as a young teenager in the 90s when they were like mm-hmm. hardcore covering like indie and women's art and like anything underground. Like this was a, this was a, a, a teen magazine, but like, the teen magazine where you would learn about teenage fan club and riot girl and Dame Darcy. (laughs) And that, those were the days we were in. And, uh, and um, yeah, like Dame Darcy's work first came to, uh, came came to my notice at at that point. So I've been following her for a really long time. Um, But there's, you guys have definitely introduced me to a lot of artists who I hadn't seen before. um, And whose work, I don't think I would have encountered otherwise. So thank you for that. It's our pleasure. That's exactly what we hoped. We wanted you to see some people you're familiar with and introduce something different to you. So uh, what did the, how did you guys decide like how to curate the work for this? Well, I think first we started by talking about what are our favorite comics? What do we like in comics? Not who, but what, what are the qualities of work that makes it speak to us? And Sean and I have a very similar sensibility in that way where the same kind of story uh, aesthetics and narratives uh, work for us, Mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the reason that we collaborate so well, I think, is that we have kind of a similar outlook and a similar voice in art. Um, So we kind of tried to define that and talked about the comics that have done that for us and the artists that have encapsulated that for us. And we made a short list, I think maybe about 10 people. Yeah, just, uh, you know, jotted it down on a napkin in the bar across the street. as we, <laughs> uh, you know, a blue sky wish list for, if, if you know, if we were going to buy an anthology, who would we want to see in it pretty much? Uh-huh. And I think we ended up getting almost all the... Yeah. And... I think Phoebe was the only one that couldn't make it. Phoebe Gleckner, she is... 
so mm. consumed with um, you know, Juarez. Been, the murders of Juarez that that's basically only. And the other one that got away that was sort of a formative idea for the anthology was Stephen Gamel, who did the old, old illustrations for the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark book series. Um, which we could is, not oh. get in touch with Pride. Yep. Our publisher, Rain, went above and, be, above and beyond the call of duty. He actually went to his house and dropped off a package of books from the publisher with like a pitch and everything. But he just, uh, you know, I think he doesn't do press, so which is too bad. But I mean, we got Clive Barker, yeah, and now yeah. Columbia, all these people, you know, we kind of and are very influential on our own, not just our work, but I think our outlook, yeah, um, our art work. in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah you guys and had in the, your the, um. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the loose themes that we wound up sort of basing the book around and and this was almost the sum total of what we asked for when we solicited contribution was just to that the work should touch on the themes of again as you said in the intro um horror pornography the gothic and the abject because we these were all artists whose work we liked and who we trusted to get it they didn't really need much more guidance than that so that's kind of how it how it came together, I would say. Cool. And I, you know, like I know in the afterward, I guess in the thank you in the back, you guys straight up thank Frankenstein and Hellraiser as well as Clive Barker and, and the other uh, big artist influencers on this. So that's true. Those are nicknames for our kids. Oh, <laughs> I thought they were the, like the general concept of Frankenstein as no, a piece of fiction. Nick- that's amazing. <laughs> Children are indeed yep. little <laughs> monsters, so I hear. But <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah. So it, it does um, kind of take like a little bit, but yeah, it worked for me thematically, regardless. So there you have it. Um, right on. Yeah, I uh, I thought that like this is a sort of book that I have out on my like, you know, coffee table. That's also my table table because I live in New York. Um, Not because it's a coffee table book in the sense of being pretty pictures that folks flip through, but in the sense that you have a lot of really short work in there that someone could just pick up, look at a couple of pages and get something out of it without actually, you know, having to read a lot of a story. And there also are a lot of really narrative illustrations in it where it's like literally just one page and the page itself is a, is a story. Um, so even though somebody might find themselves a little bit disturbed while having a beer at the table, um, it, it kind of is, is very sort of something you could dip in and out of if you if you want to look at it like that. Yeah, I think, I think that we both really enjoy short stories. Um, and we didn't really give any of our artists a page limit. It might have been like 20 or 30 pages, so pretty high. And kind of encourage them to do as much or as little as they felt they needed to to get their story out. Um, the artists that we picked, I think, who did comics work very well in short stories and that have really not more than 40 pages long. So we knew that they could pull that off and that that was going to be a format that was going to work for everybody. As for the one-pagers, I think uh, we're talking about Noel's work, the one-page comics that he does that are sort of like poems mm-hmm. that are scattered throughout. Noel Schriebert. They're like... Uh, that's the... Mm-hmm. That's the... Like on the very first page, I think, is one with somebody stepping on a nail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Nicole Clavelu's work is all one-page mm-hmm. illustrations. Uh, Al Columbia. Al does comics, uh, but for us, he gave us these uh, different one-page illustrations that are all, I think they all take place in the kind of world of Tim and Francie. Tim and Francie is, are in some of them, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. But... So they kind of are a window into a bigger story, but also a lot of them have a, a 
a story within them. When you look at them, you're like, okay, so this, this is what happened here. It's intriguing and frightening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Elf's work always looks like porn from some comic book that was banned and is now housed in like a, a locked warehouse in the Vatican somewhere. Yeah, like you just sneak <laughs> a glimpse of page. It's a, it's a really horrifying effect about his work that I've always really enjoyed. And then I guess, you know, Clive Barker, Heather Benjamin, you know, they kind of submitted standalone illustration things too. Mm. And it, it one thing I liked about it is it wound up giving us a ton of flexibility for layout. You know, we it was a really, you know, when, it, when the time came to put everything in order, the option of taking the standalone pieces and moving around uh, gave us a lot of leeway in terms of creating a, you know, whatever kind of flow that we wanted. You know, it's sort of like, it was it reminded me a lot of the old days when I would make mixtapes. Like, I need a 45-second song to close out this side. You know, I know just the one. Time to break out that song. Seven inches. Yeah, exactly, you know. Or some interlude from the rap record or or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. It, so it was the blend. I think uh, it wasn't something that we we sort of soli- we sort of uh, consciously solicited, but I, I'm I'm happy with the way. Certainly, thinking about anthologies that I comics anthologies that I like the, has a tendency to have that kind of ebb and flow of it too. Hmm. So it's rare that you just read a bunch of an anthology where it's just like. Here are eight, ten-page stories, you know, and mm-hmm. that's that. Well, nobody can, you can't really make cartoonists do that. I mean, getting them to turn and work, get all this, like, herding cats. <laughs> I say, affectionately, as a cartoonist, really unreliable. Like, our, our, you know, all of us have really uh, uh, precarious livelihoods, I think, and also just the difficult temperament that makes us think we're going to pull off a comic in six days and then we get so close to finishing it in five days and then we go to bed for a week. You know, it's, it's, you can't, you can't tell cartoonists like, okay, here's what you're all going to do. I mean, Santoro gets people to do it, but that's because those are people, like if you sign up for Santoro, of course, then you already are, uh, Need somebody to tell you what's Santoro? Oh, Frank Santoro is a cartoonist who also has a cartooning, uh, what's it called? Like a long distance course. A correspondence that you can sign course. Up for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a correspondence course. And he huh. does a where everybody has to make comics in a certain format. It's like a, a certain page, uh, ratio. Pages and it's um, you use a grid, yeah, like a specific grid, like a six panel grid. Or, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna blank on the name of graduates, Ron Wimberly. I think is one name. Oh, really? Oh, so. Ron Wimberly, yeah, I, he I, I, I think, <laughs> yep. Um, you'd have to ask him, I'm, I'm blanking on any other names, okay? But, no, that's interesting, yeah, uh, yeah but, I you know, and that's familiar. That's what you're coming. So, yeah. You know what I mean. The mm-hmm. challenge of of what he's doing is it's parametric. You know, like can I make my work fit within these parameters? Let's see what I will get out of working in that kind of. You know, whereas. Yeah, but it, it's the artists who are open to doing that, mm-hmm. and I think most of the artists that we put in our anthology already have a um a certain like pacing and style that they're comfortable with and we wouldn't want them to switch it up right. or expect them to. Gotcha. Including, I wouldn't, I would never would. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> so I'm sorry, so I'm clear. Uh, Nicole Clavelu is the artist who did the sort of black on gray and like black on black, almost single page illustrations. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm completely obsessed with her work now. I like want to give her all my money and buy things. And what was interesting to me in particular though, is that like looking at her pages, this couldn't work digitally. Like 
I can't imagine reading her work on a computer and being able to see the same subtle gradation of shading and color that I get looking on on a page. Um, you know, when we were selecting preview art to use to the promotional stuff for the podcast, you know, one of the big things I was looking at is I want it to be work that's going to be really easy to look at on a screen um, for our readers. I mean, so for, for our viewers online so they can get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, and I, there was like, there was no way I could possibly include any of her pieces on this. It's so much something that has to be seen on the page, I think. Yeah, I mean, those pages in particular printed absolutely beautifully. It's like an emulsion, you know. Mm -hmm. And she works in all kinds of styles. You know, she's done children's comics. I believe the New York, New York Review Comics is publishing her first ever English language collection this fall. And I think it's sort of her uh, psychedelic era science fiction-y kind of thing, you know, because she's French. Mm -hmm. You know, she's of that world, sort of. But I first came across her on Tumblr because of erotic illustrations that she did. She did, like, an erotic version of Beauty and the Beast that's, like, super hot stuff. And she did a whole thing about um, hat burglars, and she's illustrated other people's work. So she, she I mean, she, she's also 76 years old, I think, you know? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So she's had, like, a lifetime since the underground era you know, which manifested itself differently in France than it did over here. But I mean, that's like, she's a contemporary of those people. And we're really mm. fortunate to have her in this book, you know. Um, and and when she submitted, you know, when I, well, I guess when, when I asked her to submit, we had to do it through a translator because my French sucks. Um, I I figured we would be able to get something like the, the much more crisp uh, black and white ink line work that you see you know, if you search her name on Tumblr that's what will come up um, but what she offered us you know to select from was a large selection of pieces like this which are like you know they're, they're almost like Renee French in a way you know the, the, the softness of the pencil or whatever and, mm -hmm. um, and, and it was um, something I didn't even know that she did and just feel so lucky that we got the way that um, Rain Zinsky, who designed the book, um, got it to look on the page. It's just, it's just extraordinary. It was one of my favorite things when I first got a copy of the book to open it up and see it. I was like, wow, this looks terrific. I mean, the print quality just has to be super high and detailed in order for it to reproduce the way it has. So thank you for spending the extra money to make that physically possible. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause the cheaper print, I don't think you could even see it like that really. Well, it's, you know, it's, I'm glad actually you brought up money um, because you know, as you have a labor background, so you might as well talk about money, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it wound up being one of the more expensive books that Judy cloud has put out. Um, for a couple of reasons, you know, so some of it was the printing decisions that we made in terms of the cover and the, and the what do you call it? Edge paint. Most, I think mostly. And it was also the number of contributors, which kind of blew up on our original conception. But mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that people got paid paying an exorbitant amount by any stretch of the imagination. I just didn't want to pay an insult to me. And I was not going to name it any. The people who deserve a ton of money every time they pay. You know, I'm sorry, I can't hear you right now. I, you said um, you don't want to call any names, but people who put out, and then I lost you after that. Oh, okay. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. I was just saying, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but there are contributors to this book who deserve a ton of money anytime they draw us anything, who when, when we told them the rates that we would be able to pay, they literally said, like, wow, you're going to pay us? Mm -hmm. mm. You know, and it was so depressing. And there are tons of anthologies, again, not naming names, from people who, and companies that are pretty advanced in their status in the indie comics community that still expect to get works for, for free, uh, and 
there are justifications for that as well. I probably won't make money on the anthology, so why would you expect to make money on the anthology? And we're all just doing it for the love of the medium. But artists of my generation, I think, and younger are starting to really be have that expectation that they're going to get paid for their work and that that's what they deserve, which yep. I think is great. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and it's how how both of us make our living and you know i mean we do different things but we're both full-time freelancers and we live and die on getting paid for the work that we do the creative work that we do or the critical work work that we do absolutely and you have to pass along to the consumer somewhat you know what so to stick because when we first put it on sale there were a few people who come up and they're shocked I think it's 40 bucks. Yeah, um, but, I mean, people do. That's when true. you have a $5 zine, people are like, ooh, I didn't know. <laughs> Good point. People but, are just... Yeah, right. But I mean, like, I could see this online for free. Yeah. But that's where the oh, money went. Yeah. The money to the contributors. And I'm, yeah. I'm proud to say so. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that that is right. I mean, the way artists have been exploited in the industry is really insane. And I don't know how people... like. I mean, one of the things I frequently complain about with mainstream comics is there's a lot of really sloppy art um, where, like, you look at a page and you're like, this nose didn't get inked. This is very irritating <laughs> to me. This nose is uninked. And I don't believe for a minute that any right artist, inker, you know, penciler is sitting there being like, let me do a shitty job. I'm just fairly convinced that that person has had to take on an unreasonable workload and the editor has an unreasonable amount that he or she is trying to do. And like nobody has the time because they can't afford to like financially to do the work the way they want it to be done. Um, and that's really shitty. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, I mean, when you get paid, say, $100 a page, you can't afford to take more than a day on that page. And a day yeah. is not really that to finish one page of comics. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a, a background in mainstream comics. Um, and it's always with me, the original sin of the entire North American comics industry, um, you know, which in a very real way, no matter what you're doing here, um, has been kept alive by mainstream comics and, you know, and, uh, I mean, specifically Marvel. And the original sin of the mainstream comics is the wholesale theft of the Yep. By management and by capital. And that's always with me, no matter how far afield I go from Marvel or DC or superheroes or whatever. I'm, I'm always art is labor, and uh, people upon whom we, uh, people to whom we owe our art form, really, uh, we're taken advantage of. And uh, you're talking about artists, creators, uh, stories. Characters and everything, and then not seeing the topic. Yep. Not yeah. being yeah. I mean, again. You're not familiar with comics so much. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 But, like, you know, the rights that they deserve, the money, the royalties that they deserved, and some having their from them. You know, that was, it's crazy to think of, but that's what happened to Jack Kirby. He drew things yeah. for them. He was supposed to get them back. They never gave them back. And then it disappeared because people had been selling it off to make money for themselves for all these years. And that's always with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it should kind of be all, with all of us, no matter what segment of comics that we work in or what our particular style is. You know. um, strongly, strongly agree here. Actually, Julia, I'd love to hear from you. Like, how did you get interested and involved in illustration as a practice yourself? Um, I don't know. I mean, I I was one of those kids who drew a lot. For me, uh, to go to art school, I it kind of had wanted to be like a, a an archaeologist. When I got to be in high school, I was really too depressed to do anything that rigorous. <laughs> so, hmm. uh, and when I went to art school, I decided to major in illustration because 
I wanted to be really good at drawing and the illustration students portfolios were always the ones with the most beautiful drawings. Um, and my favorite artists at that time were probably most, uh, I really liked and still do, uh, Maurice Sendak, uh, uh, Maxfield Parrish, uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, and even as I got older, you know, my taste still began to expand quite a bit. Uh, but I think that my conception of art that I wanted to make was always narrative, uh, even though for making fine art type work. And I actually, I ended up graduating with a fine art degree in uh, printmaking and painting. And sort of, I think that there's a, a little bit of a, at least my experience was that people were looking a little bit askance at illustration as not discipline as fine art. I, you know, I always remember uh, when I was in art school who I said to him one time, you don't like my work, do you? You don't like my art. And he was like, well, I mean, I think of it more as illustration, which was not supposed to be a compliment. So that kind of encapsulates the attitude uh, uh, and I was always drawing pictures of things, of people, of events from stories that I was reading. And uh, I wasn't really, I wasn't thinking of doing comics like that, although I did do comics, uh, like little mini comics and stuff on the side, because I also made zines in high school and illustrated them with different types of um, including comics about me and my friends and fantastical things happening to us. Just, you know, to, and, uh, uh, but I, I never thought about really combining those two practices um, until when I moved to Portland and all, like, a ton of cartoonists live in Portland and aware that I was getting involved in fine art things. There are a ton of people who were cartoonists and that I think maybe uh, I have more of a cartoonist temperament. Those are the people I'm close to. And they kept encouraging me to make comics. And so that was what I started doing. And it turned out to be a much better fit for me, I think. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I didn't go to a, I, I went to a university that had a very, very big arts program, but it wasn't like an MFA type program. And, you know, there, there was so much uh, sort of continual hangover from like performance art and social interaction art and like not a whole lot of focus on, you know, people like learning how to draw representational art with skill and detail. And it's always been something because you know, like I grew up reading comics, so like I really appreciate it. And it always sort of feels a little bit like wizardry when people are able to pull it off so well. And, um, you know, I just really love the, the detail and the skill of your art. Um, when I'm, you know, it's, it definitely see the printmaking background as well, though, because if you told me it was etched, I would believe you, you know? Yeah, it, 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 it's funny because my drawing style looks, like printing, like you said, people have compared it to woodcut too. Uh, and I haven't really done very much printmaking outside of like having it as my major. I mean, I've worked as a letterpress printer, but uh, I mean, printing my own work because it, it's like a little bit too, uh, you know, you make multiples and you have to stand there and look at each one and it's like just standing and staring at your face in the mirror. Like it's exhausting. You get sick of mm. yourself. I do. Um, so. Hello. Sorry. My phone went off and I didn't realize it. Go ahead. It's awesome that your ringtone is the immigrant song, by the way. <laughs> it is. My ringtone is immigrant song and I applaud your ability to recognize that so quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt the Zeppelin. No, I didn't mean for Zeppelin to interrupt either. So <laughs> continue. Sorry about that. 
Um, so uh, we were talking about your, your printmaking and like why that isn't really satisfying to do professionally. Yeah. But I, I ended up gravitating towards making books, uh, printmaking and still working with multiples. Uh, it's not the hand printmaking, like, you know, hand pulling with the graph prints or whatever, but, um, I do like making books. It's just, you know, I run them through the photocopier. I don't have to, and I don't have to look at each one. And then when you don't want to look at the pictures, you can close the book and put it away. I really like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, a lot more comfortable. My drawing style is definitely, uh, has grown to be one that photocopies very well. That's part of the, why the, why it looks like that. That makes a ton of sense. And I know that one of the other things that you do is you do these postcard series where folks send you some money and you send them a postcard depicting a thing of your choosing, which is so yeah. data. I love it. Like, I mean, I, for one thing, I'm really excited to see all of these, you know, just regular people, like not rich people, regular people spending money on art um, because it's, can be affordable and we're able to have, you know, art that doesn't live in museums and art that's able to be consumed and owned by people in different ways. And um, I thought yeah. that, that was such a cool way to do it. I don't know if you have followed my Twitter or anything, but I did recently tweet the um, Bread and Puppet Theater's Cheap Art Manifesto. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you familiar with it? I am. You know the Bread and but Puppet I think Theater? That my listeners, like a- but my, my, yeah, my listeners might not know it, though, so go ahead and, and uh, talk about it a bit. Vermont that I believe started in probably Greenwich Village in the 60s and then they this collective uh, moved out to a a farm in Vermont and they do shows uh, performances uh, with these handmade puppets they're like big life-size puppets puppets, as well as small ones Uh, and they also sell prints and zines that they make there uh, very inexpensively. Uh, they make calendars, all kinds of stuff. So this is a poster that I, I, my parents started taking me to the Bread and Puppet Theater when I was really little. So I have a lot of their posters. Uh, and this is one that I've had for a while. It's not too long. Can I read it? Please. Okay. It's the Why Cheap Art Manifesto. It says, People have been thinking too long that art is a privilege of the museums and the rich. Art is not belong to banks and fancy investors. Art is food. You can't eat it, but it feeds you. Art has to be cheap and available to everybody. It needs to be everywhere because it is inside of the world. Art soothes pain. Art wakes up sleepers. Art fights against war and stupidity. Art sings hallelujah. Art is for kitchens. Art is like good bread. Art is like white clouds in the deep. Hurrah. Hmm. It's really perfect. So, and I think that's something that yeah. comics readers should be able to appreciate too. Um, since we buy yeah. art comics. for small amounts of money every month <laughs> or week. Yeah. And one thing that only one person can, you make a million of them and sell them for cheap so that a million people can appreciate it. And I really see this boom in like people selling affordable representational art in multiples, like whether it's a inkjet print or a Xerox um, or, you know, just comics themselves really, uh, which I, I, I makes a lot of sense because like that's generally what people enjoy in the end of the day. Yeah. People really like representational art. I mean, people like all kinds of art, um, but unless you have like an artist kind of your hobby or a major interest of yours, it's usually representational art that they recognize what it's about, they see the things that, so it's a little more popular. Mm -hmm. 
actually, I just realized I should probably define this for my listeners. When we say representational art, we mean art in which you're depicting specific people, objects, places, things, where a person could look at it and say, oh, that's a house. Oh, those are people. Or even if it's completely, you know, trippy and bizarre, you're still able to recognize, oh, uh, one of the pages in um, Mirror Mirror 2 has, like, okay, that's a woman in a uh, dress from the Civil War era getting eaten out by a frogman. But that's representational <laughs> art. That's the best kind of representational art. <laughs> I, am, I very much agree. I very much agree. Um, so uh, if we have a minute to talk about some of your own comics, Julia, um, I, I was wondering, like, have you thought about doing like a compendium of your mini comics into like a, a book where we could like look at them all? Sure. I, I mean, that really badly. Kind of something that I keep on pushing back because I have comics and I'm like, oh, well, once I realize that that could be in it. It's nothing that I really have put a lot of work into pursuing because I'm so interested in just making more comics and once they're made it's hard to get excited about like uh, negotiating a publishing deal Uh, so I'm just kind of it's not urgent for me and I'm Mm -hmm. waiting to have it kind of happen by mistake Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) I bet about it me that a lot but you know I keep all my minis in print in perpetuity there's not a there's not a limited print run of any of them so people can get them uh, mm-hmm. you don't have to buy an anthology but you do have to pay five dollars a piece it's so if you want a lot I, well, yeah <laughs> it's interesting just because for me like coming into comics from primarily reading superhero comics, like the whole mini comics thing was kind of new to me as a form. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that if you're making your own work yourself from like start to finish, you know, you're the writer, you're the artist, da, 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 like you're going to have a, a format that's a bit more compact and a little bit more like a short story. Um, but it's definitely different from what folks in my position are used to consuming. I mean, it's not that different from like a one issue of, like a floppy comic, right? I don't know. I don't read those comics. <laughs> <laughs> well, generally those are now. I guess uh, this change is, is relatively recent, but you know, within the last two decades, you basically, uh, like, you know, if there's a standalone issue of a superhero comic now, it's like, oh wow, it's just, you uh-huh. know, most of them are aren't even it's not even like the soap opera format of the old X-Men comics where it's just one you know, it's like there's chapter one it's almost more like a television where, where yeah I feel like that's insidious that's like a uh, like all the other push towards you know like you're not allowed to buy just one you have to buy all of them mm-hmm. it doesn't have any value well, I know that when it started it was a reaction to what was being the sort of chaotic um, over extended plotting of like X-Men comics in the 90s when things just went on forever and there was no resolution. So when it was really, I guess, Marvel 15 years ago or 17 years ago started doing these like each, you know, we're going to write for the eventual collection. So each story will be about 16 issues long and we'll tell a story from the beginning to the end. It was like a it actually was a step in the right direction, but you're right. There's an element of like, in order to understand this, you need to buy the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So anyway, you're talking about uh, how many comics are standalone. That's mm-hmm. what. Hmm. Yeah. I guess yeah, definitely... most mini comics not continuous. Uh, one after the other. Mine are all like discrete stories, I think, with different characters and stuff. You definitely have a lot of themes, though, in terms of, you know, t- writing, uh, writing slash drawing about religion and folk tales and loneliness. And, I, you know, it's, it's definitely the sort of thing where I think if somebody likes one of your pieces, they're, they're going to like the rest of it, too. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, both subjects that interest me a lot. Uh, and when I do my own reading for pleasure, for research. It's usually nonfiction on those topics that I'm reading about. I don't 
read a lot of fiction uh, and certainly not a lot of comics, uh, almost never. But, uh, you know, I like to read about history. So a lot of that shows up in my work. And just speaking as a Julia fan, <laughs> which I was before I was Julia's operator or like romantic interest or anything. God bless um, him. <laughs> What I, one thing I've always liked about Julia's mini comics is that she sticks the, they're very uniformly formatted covers have a similar style each time there's sort of a wrap around image from the front. yeah like a series yeah no they're not the same it's more like right right or I always I've always thought that if you were born 10 15 years earlier than you were you would have you would be doing this in the 90s, and instead of like publishing them individually, cake. yeah, you'd have Meat Cake or Dirty Plot or Acme Novelty Library or Eight Ball or whatever, and you would just be, instead of releasing them each under their own title, like each story, you know, Palm Ash and Dark, Dark Age or whatever, mm -hmm. you would have whatever your umbrella title was, and then each one would have, a, you know, a, I've always really done that about uh, it just it scratches an itch I have as like a, a person who likes to make lists and <laughs> on bookshelves. <laughs> you know? Yeah, me too. I like to I try to make all the books the same because I don't like it when they don't look good together on the shelf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that makes so, sense. Into our yeah, that's why that's why Mirror Mirror Two is the size that it is. Oh God! Because it matches the size of Julia's uh, books for Fantagraphics. Mm. The same size. Oh wow! How funny is that? I love it. That's really funny. Now you guys, I think the first comic you guys did together was the Edgar Allan Poe one, correct? I think so. I feel so, like um, our audience needs to know about that existing <laughs> and and what that entails. Well. We, we've done two uh, erotic adaptations of the Edgar Allan Poe short stories. We're working on more. Um, the first one is The Cask of a Bunch, uh, which into a very dirty comic called uh, In Pace Resquiescat. Uh, and the second one is The Fall of the House of Usher, which our comic is called the hideous dropping off of the veil. And those are both available on my Etsy store. My Etsy username is Thorazos, if anybody wants to check those out. And I and guess what sure. we tried to do with, um, you know, the division of labor, I guess, is like I wrote the scripts and you drew it, but there was a lot of back and forth on every sort of stage. It's really hard. Our, hard. our discrete jobs, but then every stage also involves a lot of like talking together about what, what we're working towards. Yeah. So like you'll go off and write the script and I don't like look over your shoulder and be like, no, have it be like this. But before you write the script and while you'll be, you know, we'll check in with each other mm -hmm. about. Right. And then, and the same when I'm drawing it, you know, I'll be like, are you picturing it more like this or more like this? And we'll talk about what will work. Right. Cause we're going for the same goal in the end, which is kind of to tease out, the um, um the sort of the sexual subtext of Poe, which is barely subtext. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's we don't have we you don't have to dig to it. I don't think we're don't the first people to guess that Roderick and Madeline Usher might be fucking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you tell? It's no, so it's funny. funny. I I uh I'm a huge fan of Poe. He's like one of the writers. I mean, he's not totally prolific, so I guess it's not that surprising. I, who you know, I've read like everything. And um, mm -hmm. I, I hadn't really thought about it this way at, at first, but I, I was thinking, like, this is actually, like, the erotic Poe fan fiction comic that nobody realized yeah, yeah. needed to happen, but it totally did. Yep. Well, I think that's something that fan fiction has really uh, given us as a, as a cultural movement and art form is that um, that sense that, like... Uh, small gestures and relationships you can like read into them uh and discover like these hints towards you know well it would it you could almost see how they might have sex here and how would that you know deepen your appreciation of the story or whatever so i think it makes sense for us to go back and do that with you know we're not like harry potter fans we're a girl 
on Poe's fans. So it makes sense who that would the work that we like. <laughs> right. So yeah. <laughs> so now my my fans are below George Yeah. But yeah, it's it's when I when I. It, Sorry, I totally lost you there. You um, said when I. Are, sorry, I lost you there. You said when I, and then I uh, didn't hear anything after that. I and have, I still can't hear you. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Okay. I was just going to say that there's elements of fan fiction as a movement that um, have a bit in terms of like people in the audience, like just substituting their own pre-existing ideas for like the chance of interacting with an artist astral plane where art actually lives, which is always more exciting to me. However, I have always really liked and kind of preferred when the gist of fan fiction is just like, is just to make it porn. Like <laughs> to me, it's like much more, for whatever reason, it's, much more acceptable to do that kind of thing just to get off than to actually insist that like no um you know it's perfectly uh you know noble to um to fall in love with a a serial killer or whatever as if if that's what that actual story is about it's like may not be noble but it could be hot as a fantasy Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we're getting at with the poem like yeah, it's yeah, just like it's, a little more fun. It's not like how this is how it should have happened. This is what's really happening. Right. It's just like, wouldn't it be fun to do? Because right. I mean, hmm. it's, it's porn. That, that, that stuff is pornography. You know, those those comics are They're like, fair. like, and my intention is to, you know, yeah. rev people's engines, you know? Yeah, they've seen everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I hopefully, hopefully it works works in that way. Yeah, I always just want to say that, but it seems a little uh, awkward. Yeah, have fun jerking off to this. Like it's, <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, yeah, like I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of art that sort of has the dual intention of, you know, being something folks are supposed to get off on and also being something that's intellectually stimulating and all or is going to make you say, like, oh, this is creative, on top of it being erotic. You're, like, appreciating uh-huh. that it's doing something witty or insightful or that'll shift your view of something else that you've looked at. So, yeah, totally. It, and it has a lot in common. Um, you know, I think good porn uh, has a lot in common with good horror, which is that like all of it lives in things that you can't talk about. You can't bring yourself to say, you can't say in, in polite company, you're afraid to say, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. And, uh, so I I appreciate that I I, I like to, uh, to to me the connection that I think we then made in Mirror Mirror too, which combines work that's sort of erotic or sexually explicit with work that's horrific, sometimes both at once. Um, that connection makes perfect intuitive sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. There's a really neat comic by Simon Hanselman in Mirror Mirror where he's definitely looking at the sort of agony of creation and like opening yourself up to and how that can be that one i'm sorry sean wrote that oh dur yes he did yeah (laughs) so do you want to talk about that piece Uh, a little bit more sure sure Uh, first of all you know a compliment's genuine when the person paying it doesn't even realize they're paying it to you so thank you (laughs) i'm really glad that you like that piece um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's very much. What, I mean, it, it's 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 drawing on things from my own life, including some stuff that I, I don't think I realized it was drawing from when I wrote it. Um, um, about, you know, without getting into too much detail, but like my own history and of uh, um, being an abuse victim, and it, it the gist of it is it's a Megan Mog strip. You know, Meg is Simon sort of protagonist in most of his is a witch and in this case she's just like hanging around making art and this black flame demon thing that she maybe was once romantically involved with maybe it was something much more insidious more it's not it's not the relationship is not quite clear but she recognizes right it 
Right. And they have some sort of intimacy that the black flame even sort of literally rekindles in her body as she's working on this art, which she tells it is sort of reflective of their pre-existing relationship. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how to describe exactly what I was going for there. Um, just that there's, I think, a, a satisfaction and a, and a, a, a a creative satisfaction and a creative flame, not to go overboard with the metaphor, opening yourself up to uncomfortable emotions and situations like that. Um, that for me is where my best work is always, it's what I respond to the most, the, the most strongly as a, as a critic and as a writer and I think as a now as an editor or anthologist or whatever you would call one of this book, um, I was just trying to put together. You know, I think both of us were trying to put together work that had that sort of effect. You know, mm-hmm. and it's painful. It's, it's sort of a it's a productive pain in a way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I definitely also sort of felt from it how, like, there's definitely a commodification of creator, of, like, artists, like, pain and stories of their suffering that is sort of called upon if you want to get certain audiences be published in certain spaces, et cetera. And, you know, obviously, like, we make art because we want to work out a lot of these functions, but there also is a certain amount of, like, people... Like, this might be a little bit more specifically true for people who do, like, personal essays and stuff, but it's also true for artists, too, right? Like, to talk about their pain and, like, that that's the thing that people want to consume from them. And then I started thinking about the Rolling Stones song, It's Only Rock and Roll, which is about that exact theme, <laughs> despite being uh, yeah. relentlessly up-tempo. Um, but, yeah, that was sort that's of how funny. I felt about it as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because a lot of indep- a lot of art comics and independent comics are really very fiercely personal and vulnerable. I hope so. I, I, I mean, I think that that's something that's really special about small press and self-published comics is that the all of the weirdness and uh, idiosyncrasy doesn't get ironed out in meetings. You know, like you don't have to ask anybody or run it by anybody, you just, it goes straight from your desk to the readers, and they have to meet you first, and it creates, like, a much more uh, intense relationship between creators and their audience, who, which is a role, a lot of the readers are also creators. I think definitely. Medium. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. It's, it's still, you know, as much money has come and gone and come and made out of the industry and into it over the past however long, and you know, as as much as it is now a much uh, bigger deal on the sort of larger cultural horizon, comics is still a free for all in a lot of ways. A creative free for all. Because it's it's one place where you can just sit by yourself, and answer to nobody, and put out work exactly as you want it to be, and um, that's tremendous. That's all. That's what Jimmy gets to That's honestly what Jimmy um, is. I'm like, wow, you can do anything here, and no one will. If you don't, if you don't want to be told no, you don't need to be told no. The barrier mm-hmm. to entry is very low. All you need is you know, a ballpoint pen and some paper and access to a photocopier. You don't have to be, like, a really good artist. You don't have to be, like, a really good writer. Those things help, but you, if you have at least some of both, you can make something. Yeah. And yeah. if it's good, then, you know, people will be asking you to be in their anthologies for free before you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Sad but true. Oh my God. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us again. Um, I, I we really love talking about the book. And so, 
Uh, tell our listeners where the internet can find your the internet, where the internet and our listeners can find your work online to check out more and to, to purchase Mirror Mirror Two. <laughs> You can buy Mirror Mirror 2 on the 2D Cloud website. That's the, no, the numeral 2, the letter D, C-L-O-U-D, dot com slash mirror hyphen mirror hyphen I-I. Uh, and you can see more of me on the Internet. Uh, my username is Thorzos on Twitter and Etsy and Threadless. And also Thorzos.net is my website with links to all those things <laughs> if you need more help with that uh that is p-h-o-r-a-v-o-s and you can also uh commission me to draw tattoos you can buy my comics and uh this is my drawings on them too at those places and uh i'm i'm at you can find me on twitter at the sean t collins you can find me. Uh, you can find my website at seantcollins.com, which is house for everything that I write professionally. I'll link to there. And uh, my main Tumblr is boiledleather.com. It uh, is loosely, mostly about a song of ice and fire and Game of Thrones, but it too houses basically everything that I write about professionally. Will wind up there. Uh, um, almost any interest that I have. So yeah, boilleather.com and uh, Twitter at the Sean T. Collins. That'll get you to all the stuff that I do and every place that I do it for. And yeah, guys, if you're, you know, if you're fans of A Song of Ice and Fire books, uh, this is definitely, I mean, you probably already know his blog. So, but like, seriously, this is one of the absolute must read blogs about A Song of Ice and Fire from a really literary perspective that's talking about the work from a standpoint of what it's saying and how it's doing it rather than spending all of its time speculating on what could happen next or like developing fan theories or whatever. Like this is a, this is a writer who's treating game of Thrones and the song of ice and fire as art to be analyzed uh, for its own expression and merit and not just like a whodunit mystery. And I'm so glad to have that because I just have very little interest in hearing a million fan theories all the time. So thank you. Highly endorsed, highly endorsed. Well, thank you guys. Um, and for our listeners, if you came onto the episode late, uh, you will be able to listen to this less, this episode in full online at graphicpolicy.com uh, on iTunes at gra- if you follow graphic policy on iTunes, SoundCloud and Stitcher as well. Also graphic policy. Eventually um, you can always also listen to this episode on our website uh, later as well. And uh, always be sure to check out graphicpolicy.com for coverage of comics, geek culture, the intersection of all of that and political uh, activism and politics of the world today. Uh, You can find me on Twitter all the damn time at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. And Graphic Policy is also on Twitter at graphicpolicy.com. So thank you guys so much and have a great week. Keep it geeky. And we'll be back on Monday to talk about San Diego Comic Con, which is a thing that happened. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.